Do you remember where you were the night of the slap? <laughs> My wife Nicole and I were watching the Oscars that night for the same reason we do every year. So that when the inevitable groans emerged the morning after about how lame, long, or predictable the show had been, we'd at least know what all the hate was about firsthand. <laughs> Plus, if I may be sentimental, there's still something magical about the movies. And I still appreciate the glamour, the dad jokes, the nostalgic navel gazing that the Oscar ceremony provides. Indeed, there's a comfort in the expected, in the tradition that brings the audience back each year. Or at least there was. Before award presenter Chris Rock made an easy joke about Jada Pinkett Smith's bald head to the ire of her husband and best, best actor nominee, Will Smith, who got up from his seat, sauntered onto the stage like he was Jim West, <laughs> and slapped Chris Rock dead in his mouth, and then casually walked back to his seat <laughs> to hear the nominees for best documentary. <laughs> To those who only heard about the next day, I, I can't stress how surreal it was to watch in real time. As a lifelong pro wrestling fan, I was convinced that it had all been a work of some sort, some poorly executed bit. But it was clear that someone had gone off script when the notoriously clean rapper yelled at Chris Rock, keep my wife's name out your fucking mouth while wearing a tuxedo. <laughs> from the front row of the Academy Awards to the stunned silence of a Hollywood elite. The whole display had been an attack on our collective sense of reality, a truly traumatizing televised event on the level of a live suicide or a woman's nipple. <laughs> Far from a work, it was a certified real moment in a life where everything can be such a performance. And while that moment left so many people absolutely shook, appalled that Will Smith ultimately won Best Actor instead of being immediately arrested, shackled, and dragged out of the Dolby Theater for the safety of all in attendance, all I could do was nod, suck my teeth, and turn to Nicole and think, I wish a motherfucker would say something about my wife. <laughs> I tell you, I was fuming, but not out of anger, I don't think. It was more like this shot of adrenaline that had me pacing up and down my living room, mentally flipping through my go-to rage fantasies. <laughs> Some faceless aggressor mouthing off to my wife, me tossing him through a plate glass window, <laughs> or punching him in his throat, or knocking him down on his ass and crushing his ankle so that he can't get back up maybe cracking him in the jaw with a thick, hard-covered book, or simply snatching the asshole by the collar and demanding that he apologize to Nicole before I stomp him to the fucking ground! <laughs> because like Will Smith, I understood what it meant to defend my wife's honor in the most chest-pounding way possible, and to expect to be applauded accordingly for my chivalry. <laughs> That night, I chatted with a friend who works in PR. She proclaimed the whole thing very messy and said that we may even be witnessing the end of Will's career. After all, his whole brand had been built upon being a good guy, one who just oozes positivity and who can put us all at ease with a flash of a friendly smile. Indeed, he was so beloved in large part because he was so friendly and inoffensive, so non-threatening. And he had thrown that all away with one impulsive move. But I didn't see it that way. <laughs> yes, the moment had been disruptive, and it had clouded every highlight of the Oscar telecast both before and after the slap itself. Nobody cared anymore about historic wins or why exactly we don't talk about Bruno. <laughs> but at the same time, Hollywood loves violence. 
war, cowboys, cops, and killer robots? Was not the slap followed shortly thereafter by a tribute to the Godfather? <laughs> More importantly, we as a society love violence. Who among us hasn't enjoyed a ghoulish true crime podcast or a chaotic world star video? I know that I've fallen down a rabbit hole watching videos of flagrant racists taking beatings at various fast food restaurants. And that's just it. We especially love to see a bad guy get his ass handed to him, to see him punished, embarrassed, and erased, because that is what justice looks like. That's not to say that Chris Rock who once joked that the reason we have so many fat kids around now is that there aren't enough bullies to take their lunch money, <laughs> is necessarily a bad guy. But that night, he'd insulted the dignity of another man's wife, and custom dictates that it's up to that man to protect her honor and to send a message. The inevitable online discourse began that night with some initial finger wagging at the Fresh Prince. But I chalk these early returns up to the ignorance of those who demand peace in a society without the stomach to do what's needed to keep it. I'd expected a segment of the population to celebrate Will the same way we celebrate tough guys on screen. But as the night wore on with more reactions, there appeared to be scant support on the socials for this particular outlaw. <laughs> I've forgotten, of course an important factor in our culture's response to violence. That while a white guy with a loaded gun might save the day, a nigga with an attitude is a dangerous thing. Because in our society, there's a difference between white violence and black violence, between soldiers and gangsters, patriots and thugs, and where aggro white boys are permitted to take up all the air in the room Black men are taught from a young age to stay small or else. Our love affair with violence tends to turn sour when committed by black people. And when even the threat of that violence spills out of its designated space, something has to be done. This is a decent, civilized, law-abiding society after all. And if we, that is, the blacks, wish to be accepted as full-fledged members of this society, to be invited to all the posh parties, and to be honored with trophies and money and fame, then we're going to have to learn to suppress our savage behavior. That night, I argued with another friend, a white friend, a good friend, now former friend, <laughs> who shared with me that he was sick of hearing my takes on race. <laughs> and that Will Smith just needed to learn how to, quote, behave himself. <laughs> I shared with him a tweet from another black professor I know about how white people were generally incapable of thinking outside of themselves as the universal and were constantly pathologizing black behavior. In the end, as far as his former friend was concerned, my refusal to denounce the slap meant that Will Smith hadn't been the only Negro that night who didn't know his place. And so after a tense back and forth with this fool, I turned around and I dropped him with one punch and stood over him, seething, wiping the spit from my lips, barking in his face, who the fuck are you to tell us how to behave? All in my head, of course. <laughs> because in reality, I've never been in an actual fight. <laughs> A big reason for this is that I've always been afraid to get hit in the mouth. <laughs> when I was four, I had an accident in the bathtub that resulted in my prematurely losing my two front teeth. I remember my mother rushing into the bathroom and my grabbing hold of her, sobbing, soaking her nightgown in blood. And ever since then, I've been extra vigilant when it comes to those teeth. To this day, I use my tongue to cover my gums every time I walk up a flight of stairs. 
afraid to leave myself unprotected in the event that I fall. And I avoid situations that could get me rocked in the mouth. Of course, that is to stop people from assuming that I'm asking for trouble in the rare event that I have to ward off drunken hipsters in my neighborhood, I can get by by simply making myself real big and loud like in a bear attack. <laughs> I've got the kind of look that tends to keep people from openly challenging me <laughs> or, for, or from asking me for donations outside of Vons. <laughs> It's a look that had the folks at one job constantly asking me, what's wrong? <laughs> Just because I didn't smile all the goddamn time. <laughs> a job that I inevitably lost because my lack of obvious joviality supposedly scared the shit out of some people. All while my white colleagues complained, argued, threw the occasional chair, and freely whipped out their proverbial dicks in staff meetings. My problem, you see, was that I had failed to make myself sufficiently small. Another such failure occurred a couple of years ago, just before another vamp performance. While having dinner ahead of the show, a white family, a woman, her young kids, and a grandmother sat at a table awkwardly close to me and my wife. The kids scrambled around their space and ours, while mom and grandma kibitz along with no contrition towards us and no apparent interest in their disruptive offspring. The little girl had this nasty stuffed animal that she dragged along the floor. And at one point she dropped it directly into my wife's plate. I turn to the mother and raise my arms to convey my annoyance simply to say, Turns out, she did, in fact, mind. She started berating me, accusing me of terrifying her kids, who by now were both hiding underneath the table. I calmly offered that perhaps it was her own yelling and cursing that had frightened her children. Because keep in mind, up to now, I literally hadn't said a word to this woman let alone to her raggedy children. <laughs> but it was enough that I had dared to shift out of my lane to suggest that she probably do well to keep an eye on her own. Imagine if I had shown her exactly just who I am <laughs> and what I could be. Didn't this woman know how many tables I flipped over in my own head? <laughs> How many people I'd imagine beating into a wet mess into the pavement? We got out of there before anyone got hurt, frankly, before my wife could beat the shit out of her. <laughs> and I later hit the vamp stage drunk on Karen, acutely aware of just how easily any of us can turn and be turned into monsters. And then there was this time back in college. I shared an apartment with a bunch of guys, and I came home from work one night to find the homies on the couch with a few open beers on the coffee table. This guy, Max, a white guy from South Africa, a friend of a friend, really, mumbled an insult aimed at me the moment I walked through the door, before I could even put down my bag. Naturally, everyone had a good laugh at my expense, so, I plopped down next to him on the couch and asked him to repeat himself. To which he said, jokingly, observantly, though frankly, unoriginally, you're fat, in his nasal colonizer accent. <laughs> in response, I wheeled around and I decked him hard. Everyone stopped laughing. And when Max finally lifted his head, there was blood pouring from his mouth and smeared all across his face. Because in an ironic twist, it turns out that I had, in fact, knocked out his two front teeth. <laughs> I apologized to Max right then, and again later when we ran into each other on campus, his dental implants looking remarkably real. 
And we wrote the whole thing off as an accident, horseplay, boys will be boys and all that. It wasn't even a fight, technically, because, of course, Max hadn't had a chance to hit me back. <laughs> and even he agreed, as others had, that he'd been long overdue for a pop in the mouth. <laughs> but what stays with me is the idea of just how quickly things can go sideways. My life could have been over in that instant had Max's wealthy parents seen the value in flying all the way from Joburg just to sue my broke black ass. <laughs> I was lucky that I wasn't rich or famous and that the world hadn't caught me slipping on broadcast TV. The thing is, you don't always know the damage you're capable of doing, even unintentionally. That night as we waited for updates from the hospital, smoking cigarettes on our balcony, I laughed nervously and told a roommate who'd witnessed the incident that it was all just so strange because it hadn't even really been bad. He took a long, perceptive drag, turned to me and said, you sure look mad. Indeed, for all the rage fantasies before and since, the actual act of attacking someone proved far less satisfying than I would have thought. Because maybe there's a difference between being a witness to violence and being the perpetrator of that violence. Maybe because true rage is so blinding that in the moment, you can't clearly see anything, least of all yourself. So far, it doesn't look as though Will Smith's life or career are quite over just yet, even if his reputation has taken a hit. His latest film, Emancipation, is based on the true story behind a famous 1863 photo in which the runaway slave displays the scars he's accumulated over the years from all the whipping he's endured. Will jump-started his cautious promotional tour on The Daily Show, and when asked about the slap, he relayed something that his mother had once said, something my own mother once told me when I was a kid, that you never know what somebody is going through. Maybe, he went on to say, somebody's mother died last week, somebody's child is sick, somebody just lost their job, and you just don't know what's going on with people and he was going through something the night of the Oscars. That's what that something was exactly had been the subject of much speculation and plenty of jokes lobbed at the Smith family. According to Will himself in that Daily Show interview, that something was, quote, a lot of things. It was a little boy who watched his father beat up his mother. All of that just bubbled up in that moment. He writes in his memoir about the time he witnessed his father punch his mother in the side of her head so hard she collapsed. That moment, he writes, probably more than any other moment in my life has defined who I am. Hearing this, I couldn't help but think about the journey of a boy whose earliest memories is of his father's fist flying in the distance while he impotently watches unscathed. Perhaps that boy learns early on that a smile might keep him safe. And so he learns how to wield his charm and to perform for his own protection. Perhaps he develops an affinity for a hero born out of violence, baptized in a pool of his mother's blood. Perhaps he grows up to be a man obsessed with relevance, with a persistent need to rescue women in particular, whether or not they ask for his help and becomes confused and resentful when they don't. And so perhaps he becomes a paradox, someone who's desperate to be loved and yet hell-bent on proving just how fleeting that love really is. Maybe a boy like that grows up ready to punch a hole in the world, even though he knows that doing so could crack the veneer he's perfected over the years and that it could easily be the last move he makes. Because despite all of that, he's expected to keep himself small, no matter how big he gets. I wasn't sure what punishment Will Smith deserved for the slap. As I saw it, if Chris Rock wasn't going to press charges, it wasn't the Academy's business to punish him ostensibly for the brutal crime of committing a party foul. 
I remember waiting for the verdict and just hoping that whatever happened, Will wouldn't be stripped of the Best Actor Award he'd won that night because so few of us had made it to the mountaintop. And to me, that would have been like erasing him from memory, as though all that time and all that work to become everyone's favorite Negro had been all for nothing. And I was chilled by the realization that whatever good we did in this life could easily be wiped out with one bad day. In the end, the Academy went from crowning Will Smith to banning this nigga for 10 years from the Oscar ceremony. The same Oscar ceremony that once saw Roman Polanski get a standing ovation while in exile for statutory rape. The same ceremony that on the night of the slap, the late William Hurt was honored in memorial despite being accused of sexual assault by the star of that year's Best Picture winner. But I guess someone had to pay for traumatizing Amy Schumer. <laughs> Long after the slap, I still see posts and hear comments from the virtuous among us, so invested they are in the villain of the day. Because like in pro wrestling, bad guys unite us. They give us someone to root against. They validate our contempt and fortify our concept of the good all while upholding our image of ourselves as good people. We think that if we can spot the villain, point him out, accuse him, see to it that he is punished, then certainly we can't be at fault. Surely our hands must be clean. I think about what the public's disgust for Will Smith says about its inevitable disgust for me. How disposable will I be? the next time I forget to smile, when the time comes for my bad day, when it all bubbles up for me, when those who praise me today tomorrow make a meal of my evil, when it becomes more advantageous to turn their backs on me than to stand beside me. There's no question that there's a limit to their love and their forgiveness. The question is, what will their limit be? What will be yours? And what will be said about me for my memoriam? That Daily Show interview concluded with Will pleading for us to all be nice to one another. For that to be possible, we may have to let go of our need to prove that we are the good guys. After all, just because we're the hero in our own story doesn't mean we aren't the villain in somebody else's. Maybe if we all stop performing so much and we have no more use for the veneer, we'll be free to live without constant fear of it being cracked. Until then, when the bad guy is next needed, you can find me out on the precipice, looking down, laid bare, my scars exposed and my tongue spread out across my gums, holding my breath, waiting for that push, and wishing a motherfucker would. Los Angeles' own, and so say we all board member, that's Dustin Markell.